Recorded at the studios of Chicago Public Media, WBEZ, this is Stages to Success. The drive to excel is universal, as is the pride in a job well done. Whether you're staring down a decision maker for a multi-million dollar contract, a television camera or microphone, a negotiating adversary, or an irate conductor, the pressure to perform can be exhilarating and exhausting. Join me and meet great storytellers from music and business. Today's guests from the symphony orchestra world are John Yeh, associate principal clarinet of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and Robert Chen, concertmaster of the CSO. John was the first Asian player in the Chicago Symphony, and Robert is the most visible principal player in the group. They've seen firsthand the explosion of Asian players into the American Symphony Orchestra ranks, or as I quip in my title, the invasion of the American Symphony Orchestras. So, you know, what led me to think ab- about this interview with you guys is talking, um, just, John, I told you, thinking of, through the thing of being a first-generation American, right? And mm-hmm. my dad my dad totally didn't get the idea that coming from Ireland with a family of 55 bucks, that being a musician mm-hmm. made any sense whatsoever, Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom was a professional musician, so I, you know, she sort of got the whole track. But culturally, like, it was nothing. I, I never, ever mm-hmm. ran into another first generation American Irish kid in the symphonies. Never. Right. Didn't happen. James Conlon. Did other things. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, but, um, you know, what was interesting was my friends who were Jewish, right? Their dads and, and you know their grandparents had been part of that big influx in Music. around the Second World War prior, prior, and then post. Yeah, and then post, and then remember all those like the Giuliani generation of the Ita- Italian Italians. musicians who came yep. over here. They, Philadelphia, um, mm-hmm. and I'm sure you ran into them in that generation that taught you. They were a huge influx, and then. What I noticed, and what Karen noticed especially when she joined the CSO, was what's going on? It's like every new audition winner is Asian, specifically from China, Korea. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you just, this is going on probably 20 years that you're seeing that, that sort of tidal wave culturally in, yet you guys are the first that I, I, John, you're the first. I was the first Asian musician in the Chicago Symphony ever. Really? Yeah. So I think of you and Joyce now as... Joyce was here two years after I okay, joined. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, as just like, oh my gosh, you know, there, there's Asian players in, in this symphony. Robert, you're from Taiwan? Yes. And did you come here with an orchestra job in tow? Did you come here for conservatory? No, I came when I was 10. Okay. I was an immigrant. Okay, so my, you, my family immigrated here. So you yourself came with your parents, John. Your parents came, but had you as a child here. We're right. both from California, you know. Yeah, we're both from L.A. You're both mm-hmm. L.A. people. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> John, or, what job did your dad have that brought him to the U.S. For well, school? he he came to school in the U.S. after he graduated college. He came to go to graduate school in the U.S. And he studied mechanical engineering mm-hmm. at Stanford, and, and then he got his doctorate at Harvard in fluid mechanics. And then he got a job in the space program. So that's why we moved to Los Angeles. Was he with Hughes? He was with TRW. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and my mom came to go to college. She actually went to Rosary College, which is out in uh, River Forest. Now it's called Dominican University. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Sure, you know that. I've pitched to them. <laughs> right there, Worked you on go. Sports field project. There pitch. you go. Yeah. So she went to uh, college here in in the Illinois area, and then uh, they met uh, in Washington D.C. I was born in Washington, and then uh, they moved to California when my dad got that job. And they were both amateur musicians. Okay. And actually, my dad, when he was in Stanford, he performed with the uh, the Stanford Chorale with the San Francisco Symphony. And then when he was in uh, Harvard, he performed with the uh, Harvard Glee Club with the Boston Symphony per- performed with Charles Munch. Okay. 
Yeah. So that over that science music overlap that happens so often. Both of my parents were music lovers, is but they your, never thought I would be a music professional. They they thought I would go into science too, just like them. Is your uh, is your mother Chinese as well? Yes. Yeah, yes. W- what? Where are they from in well, my, China? My mother emigrated from Beijing. Okay. She was born in Shanghai, but moved to Beijing, and then my dad was from Tsinghua, which is um, uh, central China. He went to college in National Central China uh, uh, University in China. Studied engineering. Okay, so the STEM fields for them that was important. Were, yeah. were, what what brought them here to the U.S. for school? Right. Okay, and we'll get back. We'll sort of get get back to that. And what about you, Robert? Where where were your parents from, and what brought them? Oh, they were both from Taiwan, uh, and I remember dis- distinctly. Um, I was around eight years old. My sisters studied piano, and I was just. You know, studying violin, and the reason for me studying the violin was that there wasn't enough space in the house for another piano. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, at least that's what I always thought. And um, at a certain point in their piano studies, uh, they're a few years older than I am, uh, four or five years older. And their piano teacher said to my parents, you know, in order for them to take the next step, if they want to be serious about being musicians. You should move to the states. Interesting. Well, their piano teacher is from the states. He's a he was a Caucasian okay uh, a man, and um, so my father had this idea um, to come to the states. He's always been a wanderer, so he, you know he he would pick up and he would go and just like that. And I I remember when he said told us, oh you know we're gonna we're gonna move we're gonna move to the states. Um, he didn't really have a plan. Okay, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear there's somebody else like me out there. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't really have a plan. You know, he had a um, he had a very ni- nice job. He was m- a manager in a, a freight forwarding company, mm-hmm. so ca- cargo. They work in cargo, and um, and he didn't have a job coming to the states. And yet, it takes a lot of courage. To well, this that, this, this, this man, I, you know, I, the more I look at him, I think, God, you know, he's he's a little nutty. <laughs> Uh, he that explains a lot. Oh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, here we were. We lived very comfortably uh, in Taiwan at the time. Uh, you know, he was sending all his kids to private school. My, you know, my sisters are going to private school, and we were all getting a musical education. It was sort of a status symbol, you know, for mm-hmm. middle class uh, Taiwan at that time. Very so interesting. You know, going back about forty years, mm-hmm. and. He just thought, well, you know, I want to I want to see what it's like to live in the states. My uncle, uh, my on my mother's side, he had moved to the states long ago. I think he was from your father's generation, mm-hmm. John. Mm-hmm. And um, he was uh, he became the uh, the head of the engineering department at Ohio State University oh. in Columbus, and so he was our sponsor coming to the okay. states mm-hmm. and. But yet your your dad brought you here so the kids could accelerate in music. Right. That's amazing to me. I mean, well, and we'll get to where the conservatories are now putting out the long longs of the world, right? <laughs> right. The move for your dad then brings you here. He's just got to find a job, which I assume he did. It was very fortuitous. Like right before he left, uh, there was a company here in Los Angeles, and they called him up and said, you know, we have this position open. And so he took it, you know. Wow. Wow, that's yeah. right. <laughs> and and did you find, did you come to the city that had the teacher Robert needed or the girls needed? Or how did you decide where to locate? Uh, I don't remember that. You know, I don't remember. I have to, t- I have to ask my dad about that. But your know. American teacher got a nice commission for sending three kids to <laughs> one studio <laughs> and one school. <laughs> a referral fee. Well, the, you know, the... The way I met violin, my violin teacher in, in L.A. was very sort of roundabout. Um, my parents decided that we needed a weekend activity. You know, so they, they put all of us, all three kids, in the, in the local youth orchestra. I, I think you know Thomas Osborne. Do you know Thomas oh, Osborne? Oh, sure. Yes, <laughs> Thomas Osborne. He Doctor. was my high school orchestra director when I went to uh, Idlewild. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah, and he amazing. plays the clarinet. Yeah. That's yeah. right. So I remember he used to drive a little Porsche 911. He put his clarinet in the hatchback, 
<laughs> wow, he's way too cool to be he's, a clarinetist. Yeah, well, he was very cool, you know, at the time. <laughs> and uh, obviously, then, Robert, your parents would have approved of the whole musician thing. Did they approve of it for a career, too? You know, I don't think they ever thought that I was going to become a musician. Mm-hmm. Um, My parents. They still talk about it. Yeah. They, they still do. They still mm-hmm. talk about it. Said, so, you know, <laughs> we we always thought that you would have gone into like the medical field or right. You know, there you go. Something <laughs> respectable. Like this. Can can they forgive you for being the concertmaster <laughs> of the Chicago Symphony? I don't think they really understand what that means. I totally understand. I totally get that. Yeah. Right, uh, and John. You th- you thought. Your parents figured what this was an avocation that you would grow out of. And, Always, yeah, yeah, and that you're going to end up doing something serious. Right. Well, you know, I followed in their footsteps by taking physics and calculus and biology and mm-hmm. all those things. I even was a, a, a pre med major at UCLA for two I, years of college. I didn't know. I thought that you had gone to Juilliard. After two years of UCLA, I transferred to Juilliard. How okay. old were you? Like five years old? Well, at UCLA? I was. I, went, I started when I was. Um, I graduated uh, high school at fifteen. Oh, uh, okay. And so I started at UCLA. Did they actually let you graduate? They they did. <laughs> they did. Believe it or not, but I turned sixteen very shortly thereafter, and then I, I entered UCLA as a science major. Yeah. And my parents. Yeah. Oh. Of course, you'll you'll go and study science, and you'll go to medical school, and you'll be a doctor, mm-hmm. and then and and you'll be successful, and that's it, you know. And yep. you'll always have music as a as a hobby. Oh, this is echoing too hard. You well, know, sure. you, you know that my four brothers are doctors, oh, and my dad yeah. was a doctor. There so you go. It, my dad following the family footsteps. He just couldn't. Well, actually, he always told me he wanted me to be a lawyer because he knew about my C and D in chemistry. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> then, that, so this is really interesting. So, mm. your 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 parents like they kind of go with it. Yeah. John, did they did they did they have a cow when you transferred to Juilliard? Well, and because I bet you weren't taking physics, calculus, and <laughs> biology and pre med at Juilliard. No, certainly not. But the thing is that I always throughout my elementary, junior high school, and high school years played music and enjoyed it and they were all for that and they rec- you know found me the best teachers they found me orchestras to play in yep. they you know encouraged my weekend chamber music uh, mm-hmm. coachings uh, and it was something that they always thought I would enjoy and enrich my life but they also thought that I would go into me- uh, uh, um, scientific profession for mm-hmm. a livelihood but then during my first two years at UCLA, I just found that I just enjoyed it so much that it was taking more and more of my time. I'd play in the American Youth Symphony with Melly Mehta. Melly Mehta. Yes, mm-hmm. Melly Mehta. Zubin's I, father. Oh, my gosh, yes, Zubin and Zarin's father. And I learned everything from him about uh, orchestras. And he always said, play chamber music. you got to play chamber music. So every spare moment of my uh, day, I would be getting together with friends and we'd play chamber music. You know, wind quintets, quintets with strings, it, all that stuff was became what I what became my passion. Right. And then uh, during the first year I was at UCLA, I won the Atwater Kent Award, and then the second year I won the um, Frank Sinatra Performance Award. And mm-hmm. everybody's looking at me from the music department, saying, "This guy's not even a music major. How come he's winning all our awards?" Mm-hmm. <laughs> so then I had I had a real you know. So of course I thought. And then I went to Aspen after my first year ah. uh, of, of uh, um, UCLA because my teacher, Gary Gray, who teach, uh, just retired from UCLA after more than 50 years of yeah. teaching there, taught at Aspen during the summers. Oh. And so he, he said, why don't you come to Aspen for the summer? It's really great. And so I said, okay. And my parents said, okay. You know, um, so I got a little scholarship, but they still had to come up with some dough. But I went, and it was life-changing. And and I would tell everybody, I said, you know, well, I won the uh, concerto competition at Aspen my first year. Mm-hmm. So I got to play the Weber Concertino with Herbert Blomstedt conducting oh the God. Aspen <laughs> Philharmonia. I, and I, amazing. I also won the concerto competition and I played the Weber Concertino. Uh, but I didn't get Herbert Blomstedt. Yeah, I'm, well, he was, you know, he was basically not that well known yet. And he had this conducting workshop every summer at Loma Linda University. And and then he got in front of the student orchestra and started conducting. I said, 
wow, this is pretty good. It's yeah. like the very first note. It was like, wow. And so I um, attempted to rise to the challenge, and then everybody was telling me, you know, so where, where are you going to go um, to to study? What conservatory are you going to? And I said, well, I'm a I'm going to be a pre med major at UCLA. And they Dr. said, you're Ye. crazy. Yeah. Yes. Future Dr. Ye. Yeah. <laughs> Future. And I, they said, you're crazy. And I said, why? They said, you can always study medicine later. You, you have to nurture and develop your talent. Right. And so I said, well, I'll think about it. And it took me, it took me two years to come up with the courage to come to my parents. I did, I did homework. You know, I, I said, where do I want to go to school? You know, where would I love to go? I'd love to, you know, study with Harold Wright, who was my, you know, yep. eventually became my mentor. Yep. And uh, did all the homework, got catalogs from, you know, Curtis and Juilliard and Boston University and things. Then one day at, um, and then I went to the counselor at uh, UCLA and I said, you know, I'm thinking of transferring. And they said, well, you know, the music field is very, very competitive. And, you know, maybe one tenth of one percent makes it to the level that you're interested in. Yep. And I said, they were right. <laughs> well, they they were right. Yeah, just and not right about you. Well, I mean, you know, they 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 said, well, you can you can try, and I said, well, you know, um, I'm going to talk to my parents. So one day, I, I'll, I'll remember this all my life. At dinner, I sat down and I just took a deep breath and I said, I'm thinking of transferring to music school, and they looked at each other. <laughs> they looked back at me, and it seemed like you know a long, very long time. But it was actually, in fact, it was about 20 seconds. And then my dad said to me, he says, we want you to be happy. That's great. And he said, if you do your best, we will support you. And that's the greatest gift my parents ever gave mm -hmm. me, besides their genes, I think. Yeah. You know, at this point in my life, I think back and I say, you know, my parents really, really supported me when it mattered the most with this gift of, yeah. you know, support. So. And the rest is history. Robert, where did you end up going to conservatory after being brought to the U.S. to grow your 10-year-old violin talent? Uh, I ended up at Juilliard, too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yes. And it was uh, via Aspen. There you go. Like mm -hmm. John. Uh, I was... Aspen was kind of a Juilliard summer school. It yeah. seemed that way. Day. Yeah. yeah. Right, and I was 17 years old uh, and... I um, was going to play for this piano teacher at UCLA, Albert Cerco. Oh, yeah. Uh, I knew and, him. Um, yeah. Because uh, I, I felt like, you know, he was offering some musical advice that oh. was really crucial to my development. Mm -hmm. And my, both my sisters studied piano with him. Ah. And um, so they said, oh, you should go play for Mr. Cerco. He's great. Yeah. So I went and played for him. And he, at a certain point, he said to me, you know, you should go to Aspen and study with this woman, Dorothy DeLay. Yep. Mm. And I thought, who the hell is that? Right. <laughs> and she sure wow, didn't look pretty... like a famous violin teacher, <laughs> no, did she? She looked no, like a cleaning no. lady yeah. when I met her the first time. <laughs> but, you know. I'd, she was I, the one. I went there, like John, uh, won the concerto competition mm -hmm. yep. that year. You know, uh, they were all looking at me sideways. Mm -hmm. you know, and these people that have been there for years and they studied with Miss DeLay for years. Yeah, they thought, "Where is this kid coming from?" Mm -hmm. Wow! Well, okay. And at the end of the summer, uh, my parents came up to uh, hear the concert, uh, and Mr. Lay call, called them into her room, and she said, "You know, I think your son is at a very good place in L.A. I was studying with Robert Lipset mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, and um, she said, you know, he's in a really good place." I would be very happy to have him in New York, but if you felt like it was uh, important for him to finish high school, mm -hmm. which I had another year of, uh, then he should finish high school, and maybe at that point, you know, he can come to New York. And my parents looked at each other, and then they, as parents often do, they discuss things without talking to the children. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Especially Chinese parents. Yeah, okay. <laughs> In Chinese. And, and they spoke to my violin teacher at the time, and my violin teacher, who was really instrumental in uh, getting me to love music and play the, the instrument, he said to them, look, if somebody like Dorothy DeLay is telling you that your son should go and that she wants your son to be there, 
you have to send them. Okay. Yep. And you know, I think that was uh, very generous of yes. my violin teacher, but it was also very, uh, like John was saying, you know, showed my how much my parents really supported what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And trusted you at age 17 to hit New York City. I don't know if they trusted me. <laughs> <laughs> but they, you know, my father came <laughs> My father came with me to New York. They mm-hmm. decided, okay, we're going to send you. And so, you know, he came for a week. He, we found an apartment, stayed, stayed there, found a roommate, and, and then he left. Yeah. <laughs> left wow. you to your own devices. Yep. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's... Um, yeah, you know, it's a really similar story to Frank Almond, who was on episode last year. Right. Um, and and if you listen back to it, he was actually accepted, but somebody lost the paperwork, so he didn't end up with Dorothy Delay, so he didn't go. Uh-huh. But then went the following year when she found out the mistake. You know, mm-hmm. but similar. Tanglewood changed his life. Aspen changed his life, mm-hmm. and uh, th- th- that story is. I think that's pretty similar yeah. across the board for a lot of musicians. Once you get into the the talent pool that is the elite, you either fall off mm-hmm. and push away forever, mm-hmm. which you certainly Many saw a do. lot. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um or it it sends you into a tighter spiral. Um Robert, it, since you at least were a little kid in in Taiwan, I, I I pose this to you, but John, you've probably studied it and thought about it. Mm-hmm. After World War II, we have the, the the Korean musicians, Japanese musicians, Taiwanese, even Chinese during the Cultural Revolution aftermath, getting really interested in Western symphonic music, private lessons, careers, classical music from the West. Do you know what that's about? Why that look towards the West and then this beginning of the dominance of the solo performance of that music? I, you know, I think it. I don't. I'm, I can't speak for China, but in places like Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, it was. And it still is uh, as a kind of a uh, keeping up with the Joneses. As you mentioned, that status symbol yes. for your parents that they take Western music private lessons. That's right. Uh, you know, it was it showed a certain social status to be able to afford uh, music lessons for your kids, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, people being who they are, you know, they 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 all want to. Keep up appearances. Keep up. You know? Right. So maybe like 150 years ago, um, I, I love Russian literature. Like they all had their kids learn French. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. Why Why Mozart, Beethoven, music from Vienna, Germany, France? Do you, do you have a notion? Why was, that, why was that an important thing to attach to? Um, maybe cultural curiosity. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Especially after uh, several decades of suppression mm-hmm. of cultural in the cult, so-called cultural revolution, yeah. I know my mom uh, had in Shanghai a piano teacher that was from Germany. Okay, Kupka, Herr Kupka. She he used to take piano lessons with this Kupka, and she'd all speak about him. So there was an international influence in certain parts of China in Shanghai, particularly after World War II, where some Western culture was sort of hinted at or disseminated mm-hmm. or shared. And then I think uh, my dad similarly had some influences of Western music. So it wasn't all co- very common, but certain people got this influence. And then as uh, technology became uh prevalent and people, you know, after the Cultural Revolution began to have information of music, for example, from Europe and America, I think they got more interested in it. And then because of their uh, desire to excel mm-hmm. in anything, I yes. think I think that, that was one of the things they de- decided they wanted to excel in. Right. When Karen um, first toured Japan with Stenic McCall, mm-hmm. she had never encountered 
Good morning. <laughs> she, she had never encountered a concert atmosphere like that that she said was almost reverential. It's like coat. It's like a coat, uh, it's like coat like. Right. Yeah. And she said that the, when they finished one of their concerts, there was a silence after they finished, almost like you're at uh, you know, Bayreuth or something, uh-huh. and then an explosion mm-hmm. that wouldn't stop. And and she said it, it, it was just an experience for her that what is it about our culture's music that drives them so wild? Hmm. Uh, and, and and you know, I I have a theory about that. Okay. <clears throat> Um, I think in Asia, and this may sound may may come out sounding wrong. Uh, there is a reverence for Western culture, all things Western. Mm-hmm. Um, in Japan, it was you know for the British, uh, the Germans, the Austrians. You really? Know. Yeah, you know that when the when the Western influence came, you know it was chic for a certain uh, section of the society to dress in a western way you okay know? like the men would wear top hats and tailcoats mm-hmm. and you know women would wear their sundresses and in korea you know the the influences were um french mm-hmm. i mean curiously enough french and okay. and russian mm-hmm. uh and and in Taiwan, you know, we sort of got the trickle down effect from the Japanese because Taiwan was a colony of of Japan. Okay. And so there was this reverence for all things Western, and they. It it's not it's not like the uh, Asians are forsaking their own culture, but they they look at this this uh, other culture and they they want to imitate, they want to mm-hmm. replicate. Um, it just comes out of some desire to to do so. I don't know why. It's like a curiosity and an uh, interest in. And then you see when you go to Japan, you see these um, T-shirts that the the kids wear that that have sayings written in English on them, but the translation is a little bit weird. And oh, yeah. you it's know, a, there's a reverse cultural thing now with all the tattoos that have, you know, uh-huh. it, you know Chinese characters, and you know these. These big guys, they go around and say, oh, you know, this means that. And, yeah. and you're looking at that and you're saying, well, actually, that doesn't really mean <laughs> that. But I won't tell you what yeah, it means. Exactly. <laughs> it's Dude. a cultural curiosity, I believe. <laughs> you, yeah. talk, you talked about the, the Asian parent thing. And I think there's an absolute stereotype, the Asian parents driving their kids to, you know, excellence, no matter what it is. Right. right? Did, did, you, did you get a taste of that with music? Did oh. you, you did you feel like your parents with music like this is part of I R I D pal so you better step up with me it was my dad saying what are you doing playing that flutophone upstairs <laughs> I mean it was exactly the opposite <laughs> what are you going to do with a degree in music cut salami <laughs> uh, but but did you get that did you get that little extra push saying you better be good at this you know I can't say that it was from my parents. But I did see it firsthand when I went away to New York. Uh, my first year in New York, I was at Julia Pre-College. And um, I saw the kind of pressure that the parents were putting on their children. Because at Julia Pre-College, it's kind of like a distillation of everything. Uh, music. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the top talents go there and they mm-hmm. have... The top talents come along, uh, comes with also the most highly pressurized parents. You yeah. know, the, the, the Driving, parents are pushy. Stage parents. They mm-hmm. want to, you know, get their kid out there and they want them to be the best, you know. And I saw that and I thought, my parents aren't like that. Mm-hmm. I, you lucky know, you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, lucky me, really. So this is the late 70s for you hitting Juilliard. The, it was actually in the 80s. The 80s, yeah. okay, and the mid-70s for you. 75 is when we yeah. started. Were there Juilliard. other Asian musicians starting to really bud up at Juilliard at that time? Oh, yeah. There sure, were. Yeah. Uh, it was, um, you know, I, I when I went to the New York Philharmonic concerts, yeah. there, at least like in 87, um, 
there were maybe three, four, a handful of a handful, okay. hand, handful of uh, Asian musicians, and they were all violinists. And mm -hmm. that's when I that's when I started working in Barcelona in '87, mm -hmm. and we certainly had no. Asian musicians yeah. in the in the Barcelona Orchestra that that year. And now you look at the New York Philharmonic, and it's it's a it's a sea of black hair in the, yep. in the violin section, right. and mostly ladies, mostly Asian. That's women. my next question. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> because my what what I wondered, and Karen saw this too. She said, "John, uh, the the women's locker room is going to have to be bigger." I right. can tell you that already. Oh yes, it and already Karen, has expanded. Yeah, yeah and Karen expanded wasn't one times. of the first women musicians in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, not like Louise Dixon when there were six of them, right? Right. Um, but what what's happening? Is it the fact? Do you think that the parents overseas are saying the boys got to go science STEM? Like sounds like your parents want you, John. But the girls, it's okay if they do something nice and delicate like music. Is that is that what's going on here? Well, I don't know. I, I I'm it not could sure. Be. It, it's it's possible. I I mean, you know, when I was at Juilliard. Uh, there were a handful of my colleagues in school that were uh, Asian. Uh, Jimmy Lin is the first one that comes to mind. You know, right? He was at uh, pre-college in, in my first year at Juilliard, and then we were at school together in my second year. And then uh, there were a few. Um, uh, Marianne Chen, my my cousin who teaches cello in Italy, and Sung Ju Lee, who's a violinist in Korea. These were all folks that were in my class, but it wasn't the majority, certainly, and and it certainly wasn't the um, uh, percentage that they have there now. Mm -hmm. I mean, now you probably get half Asians in in the school at at, at least. Yep, and so it, it's grown. Exponentially, I would say, since the the mid seventies, and it's not just. Uh, I don't think, at least from what I'm seeing, it's not just kids like you, John, who are first generation. They're pouring in from overseas too. Most of them. Yeah. Yeah. This is your host, John Hunter. If you, your group, your company, would like to sponsor our music episodes, you can have an internal advertisement placed in the podcast. Please contact me at John J O H N at jhunterservices.com. Stages to Success can be found on TuneIn Radio, Google Play, iTunes, or our RSS feed. The link can be found at www.stagestosuccesspodcast.com. Try telling your Amazon Echo to play it by commanding Play Stages to Success Podcast. We're listening to an interview with Robert Chen, concertmaster of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and John Ye, the CSO's associate principal clarinet. I want to back up to the personal uh, here again. You have two sisters, you said, Robert, right? Mm -hmm. what, what fields did they end up going in professionally? Um, it's curious that John brought up pre-med. Mm -hmm. um, my older sister, um, she also went to UCLA for pre-med. Oh, wow. Okay. And she also changed course after her second year. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, I remember the conversation with my father, and, you know, the whole family was in the car. Mm. We were driving somewhere to actually have dinner with Jimmy Lin. Oh, my goodness. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> All the connections. He's, <laughs> know, he's, he's, in, he's in the Frank Allman episode, it's too. It's very oh, strange. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, he was one of the pioneers. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, my my sister in the car told my dad that she she really didn't want to be uh, a doctor. Mm. She yeah. wanted to be a pianist. She wanted to be a pianist. Okay, and, and is she? She is. I'll be darned. <laughs> okay. There my, you go. My, I, but you know the the conversation didn't go as yours went. So whatever you do, as long we as you do, you, you, know, you want to try your best. We'll support you. It was like. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, That's the standard, uh, I think, reaction from many uh, Asian parents, and I hear about this from. But from I think many it's teachers. because you know they, because she already went down that path. Uh huh. And you know, for her to turn back. Oh, that's, it, was, it was okay. a big. It was a big deal. Change back. Yeah, yeah, it was oh. a big deal. Oh, that's I mean, interesting. What you did was a huge deal. 
Well, you know, and and I'm I I I hear stories from from music teachers that are very frustrated because they have very talented students, a lot of them violinists, and they said, um, and they happen to be Asian, and the teachers say that the parents of these young, very talented Asian violinists will not allow them to pursue a career in music. Mm -hmm. And all I have to do is tell them my story and I tell them that that's the greatest gift my parents ever gave me. Mm -hmm. So that gives them a little bit of, yeah. of uh, you know, leverage to speak to the other parents. But, you know, if it's, it's, sta it's a standard attitude amongst okay. uh, many Asian parents. Was, I, what, I think it's, it might be kind of a stereotype, but... It, what, it's, was your true. other sister a good girl? Did she end up in a, a good job? She also went into music. Oh, my gosh. Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> She's a pianist. But she did... She did end up marrying a doctor. <laughs> okay, well, they're very, very good. Very good. <laughs> right. So, and, you know, I mean, to go back to your uh, thought about why there's so many women yes. uh, playing in, in U.S. orchestras now, Asian women. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe you can edit this out, but... <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, I think... For a lot of these parents, the cachet of having sent their child to uh, a music school, you know, in pre-college, for example, they go and they engage in this activity. It's not for them to go into music. It's status for the it's parents. It's not just status. It's part of their portfolio resume when they go to apply for Ivy League school. Okay. And, you know. There is that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see it Constantly. time and time again. Yeah, they, they, that's the leverage they use to True. get into, you know, the the institution of learning that they want their kids to to go to. But what they didn't uh, didn't count on is that some of these ladies, yep, have other ideas. They have their own aspirations. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. That's right. And because there were, you know, there's such an influx, and you know, the, even a small percentage. Getting into you know U.S. orchestras, um, it it becomes quite a, a large part of the uh, um, a large part of the the orchestra body. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And John, you have do you have siblings? I have two younger sisters. Okay. And what fields did they go into? They're both in sort of uh, well, my middle sister in technology recruiting, so she recruits for technology mm -hmm. companies. And although she's the only one that really took music lessons, um, besides me, we, we she played the flute. Okay. So so we we were and we're fairly close in a. I mean, she's three years younger than I am. Then I have another sister who's uh, twelve years younger than I am, oh. who who didn't uh, have any musical education, uh, and she went into a health field. She. She's like a therapist. Okay. And, and so she um, kind of, we all had slightly different upbringings. I mean, maybe completely different upbringings. My middle sister uh, maybe more similar to, to mine because right. my parents were at the time, you know, encouraged music education as part. And then as time went on, it, it, other things became more important. But, but when they were, uh, you know, newly parents, my my parents thought that since they had had great, wonderful, enriching experiences studying music, that mm -hmm. that I should and and my middle sister sh uh, uh, should also. And, but you never got you never got the feeling like the 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 only boy in the family let him down because he went into music. <laughs> well, the thing is that when I when I um went, decided to audition for orchestras, and I and I uh, got the. Uh, position in the Chicago Symphony, I, I called my parents and I said, I got it. And they said, oh, are you going to take it? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, they said, you haven't graduated from uh, from school yet, from college yet. Because uh -huh. I had I'd, uh, I'd only been at UCLA for two years and I didn't get a degree and I'd only been to Juilliard for two years and I, of course, See, didn't have my that degree. That piece of paper is very, very important. important. Sure. 
They said, uh, are you going to take it? And I said, well, you know, this opportunity may well only come up once in a lifetime. Yes. And, and so you were right. I said, I, and I was right. And I, so I said, I think I'm going to take it. And they said, okay. And they kind of like swallowed their tongue. <laughs> and then, um, uh, but three years later, after I had tenure, I decided I'm going to go to. Uh, school again, and so I, I enrolled at Northwestern. Okay, I took um, part-time music classes, took lessons with Robert Marcellus. No kidding. And then I went back to Juilliard, and they were happy to let me take exams when we were there on tour. We used to go there twice a year on tour. Yeah, playing Carnegie Hall. So you finally got that degree. I John? finally got that degree. Congratulations. Three years later, and and my parents were happy. <laughs> That's amazing. That's am- so when, I'm not only a Juilliard dropout, I am also a Juilliard graduate. graduate yeah, <laughs> you mentioned that sea of black hair. Robert, why do you think it is happening in throughout the string sections in piano, but not happening in brass and just a little bit in woodwinds? It has to do with the will to compete mm-hmm. and the will to win. Um, is there more winning for pianists and violinists than for for the kid that's trying to keep up with the Joneses? Why doesn't he pick up the the clarinet, maybe she picks up the flute. We see that a lot. Uh-huh. But not the bassoon, not the oboe, not the clarinet particularly, certainly not the brass instruments. Why? And, John, I, I know that, like, when you go to Yamaha, they probably burn incense in front of you in a picture, <laughs> you know, in Japan. We have a very good relationship. Yeah, so, uh, but yes. you must be seeing, you know, quite a, a stable of clarinet talent in Japan, when you do and you do your master classes there, I mean, I, I, I know you're increasingly, just increasingly, increasingly in in China and Taiwan, they they are becoming more and more interested. I think it just got a later start than than the string and the piano. It just got a little bit of a later start. And I have a theory about that. Um, you know, with the piano and the violin, because they're uh, sort of. Uh, superstar instruments, mm-hmm. let's say. Okay. You had uh, people like right. Ken Hua Chung, who mm-hmm. uh, right. was like a trailblazer. Absolutely. Uh, and you, know, you had more kids who aspired to be the next Ken Hua Chung. Yeah, mm-hmm. they had more role models to look up to. Yeah, you right. Know, or Lang Lang or yes. Yes. You know, even, even right. Ken Hua's brother, brother Young, Hun, Young Hun, you know. Yep. Uh, they were trailblazers and they were um, idols. Right. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, Harold Wright or Stanley Drucker, I mean, you know, there are those people that do idolize those, but it's a it's a, on a much smaller scale. Mm-hmm. And and now you have people like John Ye. Oh, that's right. <laughs> you yes. know, and there are clarinet playing little kids in China or Korea or, or Japan, Taiwan. They say, hey, if John Ye can play in the Chicago Symphony, why not I me? Right, right. But, right. John, you know, but John isn't... Uh, a glamour glitz like me, Dory, on top of record covers. I see what you're exactly. saying. You, yep. you, you, you sell a million albums. You're, you're on, you're on the television. You're yeah. glamorized. That's right. There's yeah. more popularity. They're basically sure. popular idols, which yeah. is amazing. That's yeah. just not happening in America. Not <laughs> happening with your typical Anglo-American kid. I guess not. It's not it's there. A different. It's but, a different uh, focus. Remember? Um, uh, do you remember? Uh, I do. In in the late '80s, early '90s, we got this blitz of Finnish conductors. Right. Yarvi, uh, um, Salonen, all these people mm-hmm. just come, and you're wondering. Uh, apparently, the NHL has experienced this with goalies as well. Mm. They have this right. set inordinate number of goalies coming out of Finland. Mm. Um, and uh, apparently, it's this one school of conducting. There's in a school, Helsinki. Panula, yes. Panula. Yeah, no, Yorma Panula. It, is this happening anywhere in Asia with conductors? Are we is are we going to get hit with a, a set of them or a generation? Are you seeing them come along? Not that I know of. Uh, is there a, 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 an Asian conducting guru? I don't. I don't think so. I think the. Uh, the guru that you're referring to, uh, I think it was like Saito, oh, Saito Kinen in right. Japan, and there was a generation of Japanese conductors that you know s- oh, spawned oh. from that mm-hmm. school. So Japanese K- musicians. Karen's conductor, uh, Kazuyoshi Akiyama. Akiyama. Right. Ozawa too. Ozawa. Ozawa. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, they all came from. That's right. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's that was back in the 1960s. Though. Yes, yeah. yes. I didn't realize prior that that was... to the Finnish uh, wave. Yeah, right? and it was a smaller wave than the Finnish yeah. one. I think. Where did you play before the Chicago Symphony, Robert? I was in the Philadelphia Orchestra in the section. Yes. Mm-hmm. Even though you didn't go to Curtis. I didn't go to Curtis. Wow. Yes, I was uh, that should be outsider. The, that should be <laughs> the outsider podcast of all time. <laughs> well, it's things have changed there now too. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, there there are many Juilliard graduates that you know play in in the Philadelphia Orchestra now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you th- was that your first job, the Philadelphia Orchestra? Yes, that was my and first. John's job. first job was the Chicago Symphony. What about going back? What about when you go to Taiwan on to you obviously you guys have toured to Taiwan and China a few times now. Yep. Yes. John, you've been I mean you this is your fortieth year in the orchestra, right? Forty second year. Dude. Wow. So you've been back and forth to to China, to Japan, to Taiwan, to Korea mm-hmm. yep. scores of times. Well maybe not scores of times. Um the orchestra actually only for the first time in two thousand nine went to China. Really? With uh, Maestro Haitink. That was our first tour to the mainland China. We had been to Hong Kong before, and we'd been to Japan several times. Mm-hmm. But that was, in 2009, the first time we'd ever played in China. Interesting. And has Yamaha sent you around? I have for... been on Yamaha-sponsored tours to, to Asia. Right. Just by myself. Right, as a chamber musician. Right. Well, you know, soloist and soloist. clinician and, you know, the master classes and stuff like that. But, but that, uh, yeah, I mean, and people... Sp- try to speak with me in Chinese and I kind of look dumbfounded. So that's that's why I sort of regret my parents not sending me to Chinese school. But I, I suppose there's still time I could probably learn a few more phrases. And Robert, you as a, um, you know, a concert master of the Chicago Symphony, I'm sure you've been trotted out there for a solo recital here, teach at this conservatory here, master class there uh, in Asia. What are you, what have you seen in these years that's is there a trend that's happening there in their conservatories with their students, a uh, new level of ex- excellence, dropping the Suzuki method, anything? What's happening over there that you notice? Um, you know, I, I almost hesitate to say this, but um, it, it seems as though people are looking for shortcuts. Mm. Interesting. Mm. Uh, it used to be that the training was very rigorous. I mean, it still is, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, it's it was very regimented. It was as though they were training for, you know, uh, athletic event yep. competition. Mm-hmm. And um, th- that kind of rigor has... Uh, I don't want to say disappeared, but it's uh, it's sort of um, softened. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, in it's softened and it's it's replaced by um, you know a little bit of you know feeling good and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a well, little Western influence in a sense. They're getting the everybody is a winner culture over there and everybody gets a trophy. <laughs> oh man, they're going down faster than I thought. <laughs> no, you know, but it's uh, you know, it's I I just think that everything goes in cycles, you know. You have you had the cycle of the, the European immigrants coming over at the beginning of the twentieth century, you know, they they, they joined these orchestras and and the next wave or the Asians. So mm-hmm. at, I'm not sure where mm-hmm. the next wave is going to come from. Maybe, you know. Syst- El Sistema? Yeah, like Latin America. Right. Yeah, wouldn't know? that be something? Mm-hmm. And it, it, it'll it change, you know. Mm-hmm. People, as a culture, they, they've they been striving for this object for so long that there there might be a little fatigue mm-hmm. setting in. Okay. Um, and somebody else is going to take that place. Well, what I've noticed is that, it's, uh, uh, at least amongst clarinet students, that there are so many more of them now. Really? It's become a, a factory. You know, it's like they have and, – and I've had several students come to study with me at uh, Roosevelt at Chicago College of Performing Arts that have uh, either finished their undergraduate degree in, you know, 
the national in the Central Conservatory or and Shanghai. where's that Beijing Shanghai the, uh, in Beijing or okay. the Shanghai or various other schools there, and they'll apply for graduate school here in America and uh, and they're. Some of them are excellent. I've had a couple of really, really great players. So they uh, obviously sort of risen to the top of this huge field, mm -hmm. and um, they want to continue their studies in America because that's where they feel that they can improve or go higher. Just so like they have the opportunity. Yeah, they have opportunity. Well, just here. like the ten-year-old Robert. Chen, right? This <laughs> exactly. is the, the magnet. And yes. when John Ye was teaching a Yamaha-sponsored master class in Japan in 1981, <laughs> uh, what, what's well, the difference? That, but... but what's the difference in size from when you first did these Yamaha events or master classes to when you go now? Well, it's much bigger now. There are more students. They are they're more sophisticated. Were there four of them before, and now there are a hundred well, of them? Well, sort of, yeah. That wow. that that may be the case. I mean, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but but it's it's definitely grown uh, exponentially since then. And I think a lot of it has to do with just the information that they get. YouTube has just es exploded, mm -hmm. and they can watch performances back from you know 1970 or 1980 or early 2000s of of great Western players, mm -hmm. and and they can emulate that, and they all want to. Because they get turned on by it. Mm -hmm. Similarly to when I got a recording of Harold Wright and Harris Goldsmith playing the Brahms Sonatas from my dad when I was twelve. Yep, I said that's the way I want to sound. Yep, and so it puts something in their mind's ear and in their mind's eye now that they want to aim for, and it's become much more available, much more prevalent. And so I think it's been an explosion. And then there have been teachers that have created these cultures where it's almost a factory, you know. So mm -hmm. they, they, they have – and it, it, it's, it also has a seamy underbelly because there's like kickbacks to instrument manufacturers. And, you know, if I push your instrument, yeah, you know, I, I, get, I expect to get some money. And then if, if, you're, if my um, student – if I recommend your student to this conservatory, you know, I expect to get, you know – and they do. They're, they're, it's but that's not a, a, a particular, a specific uh, Eastern uh, phenomenon. Oh, that happens here too. Sure, it's Does just it? it's just the <laughs> okay. sheer numbers. Of I it. think right. it's been it's been like really because I don't. Does it happen here too? Oh yes. Oh okay. But here, <laughs> uh, John, you I, nobody brings me a new car or, or right. you know a bottle of uh, scotch to get into my studio. So the, maybe I haven't gotten there yet. But you and I, as Cla <laughs> as, uh, as Clara nerds, John, you, right. you know when when we deal with getting this new piece of equipment from a a particular maker, and it's a small market here, right? If right. I, if I want that Rovner Platinum uh, ligature, ligature, or mm -hmm. I want th that specific mouthpiece, yeah. right? I'm always amazed talking to the people that are doing that that kind of uh, what we think of as small market purchase or caring with their piccolos. Mm -hmm. What do they really care about? The Asian market. Yeah. Right. Because it's so vast. It's vast. Gi gigantic. Yes. Yeah. So that's where the orders are, the money is. Yes. Here it's like a throwaway. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll, it's a loss sure. leader. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, 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 make a, I'll make some mouthpieces and – and and special order ligatures or whatever for the principal of the Memphis Symphony, but right. what I really want is the Shanghai Conservatory. Yep, that's where the money is. It's 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 fascinating. So we get this like epicenter. Who knows? Maybe they're going to go up against huge tariffs now, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. That could uh, be it. Th this episode will be coming out in November, uh, probably late November. Can you uh, just give yourself some? Uh, a uh, little uh, advertisement time. Do you have something coming up next season as solo performances or chamber music performances that uh, you know people who listen to this can uh, can attend? Say you know around Christmas and into the new year. Oh, uh, I think I'm playing up at the Bennett Gordon Hall in January. Uh huh. I'm playing a recital at Ravinia. And what about you, John? Do you have a pro music thing? Anything well, coming up? Well, in January, actually, I'm um, I'm. Staying home from the Asian tour this year. Oh, you're kidding. No, no, because, uh, I mean, not only because, but there's only, 
uh, it's a very small instrumentation. Only two clarinets are required. So wow. two of us get to stay home. Wow. Lucky and so, you. Well, you know, I, I've been there and, and done those things before, and, and the opportunity came up. So I'm, I'm going to actually play the Carl Nielsen Clarinet Concerto with the Illinois Symphony. Awesome. On January 25th and 26th, I think, Great. in Great. Bloomington and in uh, Springfield. So. And I love your recording of that. Oh, I, thanks a lot. I just listened to it. I have two recordings of that, you know. Really? I know the one with uh, the Mary Stolper's on. With oh, the yeah, that's concerto. with the... Um, that was my earlier one, done mm-hmm. in 1986 with the Chicago Chamber Orchestra. And then there's one with the Chicago Symphony in 1993 okay. with Naomi Yarvey. I got to pick that one up. Yeah. That that was like a, a private CSO issue. It's like soloist from the orchestra. Neat. But I'll make you a copy. I'd love that. And I, 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 I got to... Uh, Put in a plug for your Liquid Melancholy album oh, of you. James Stevenson because my mother's commissioning club in the Twin Cities oh, commissioned right. Jim, Jim Stevenson many Low times. Low brass concerto. Yeah, and right? uh, we played, when I was at the St. Bart's Festival, we played new commissions by him for the um, Millennium. Sure. Uh, oh, wow. He's he's a really crafty like John Williams type. Oh, he's a composer. wonderful composer, and we're doing we're premiering his bass trombone concerto in June oh, that's right. with Muti and with Charlie Vernon. Yeah. I just I love that album, John, and it came oh, out of nowhere because I think I was looking for your website for links for this. Oh, okay. And well, I'm playing that great. piece with the Evanston Symphony on October 21st. Okay, probably after this broadcast, but uh, in on October 21st we are going to do the uh, Liquid Melancholy. Clarinet Concerto of Jim Stevenson, the Evanston Philharmonic. And Robert, any recordings we can reference people to that you're playing solos on or that you've put out? or I think, you know. Just get all the the CSO recordings. All the CSO and Held and Laban recordings. That and also, you know, the the CSO has uh, radio broadcasts and you can go onto the website and you can look for things. Uh, I, I play every year. So there, there's always something that's on the website that you can find. What's the concerto this year? Uh, this year, I'm actually doing a uh, we're doing a conductorless c- program. We're doing an all Mozart program, mm-hmm. uh, yes. and oh, conductorless. conductorless. Like you're going to be like the Orpheus Chicago Symphony. Well, <laughs> <laughs> conducting let's, let's from not go too far. the violin. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I'm I'm playing uh, the Mozart G Major Concerto with the orchestra, and uh, our principal flutist Stefan Hoskudsen is playing the also a, a Mozart flute concerto on the concert. Okay, and that'll be fascinating for people. So you will you lead the rehearsals? Yes. Okay, and you unfortunately, you'll, but you'll do. You know, they'll follow your bow, and <laughs> and and your and my parents, my mother played as a soloist with Dimitri Metropolis. Oh wow! And in in Minneapolis Symphony at that time, and she used to say that her favorite concerts that he conducted were when he conducted from the piano, when oh. he would do a Mozart concerto oh, or he something. He used to do that too. Wow! And and. Uh, it is a, for our, our listeners. It's a really interesting experience. Right. Zuckerman used to do it a lot right. in St. Paul. It's a, it's a, it's a different energy. Yep. Uh, you know, because it's it requires everybody on stage to really be focused. Right. Um, and there's chamber a f- music. It's big chamber. Yeah, music. and there's there's a frailty to it. I, I, I don't want to use the wrong word, but there's a it's fragile. Yes, mm. and, absolutely. And uh, I remember hearing the Schoenberg Chamber Symphony done that way once, oh, and wow. thinking this is impossible. Mm. What they're doing is impossible. The average listener thinks, oh, that, I guess that guy who waves his arms really isn't necessary after all. <laughs> uh, but but as a, a more astute listener, you think, oh my gosh. There's a lot that goes on. Yeah, you know. and that's so together, and that's so wonderful. And um, guys, Robert Chen, concertmaster of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, John Ye, assistant principal clarinet of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. What a pleasure and honor, and uh, a, a really interesting story. It's like a coming to America story. And I, <laughs> I heard my father tell it so many times, wow. uh, and 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 from a completely a really completely different cultural place with music. Um, and it's really fascinating. And I, I, I see why. I see why that sea of black hair is there. Mm-hmm. Talking with you guys today. Thanks a lot and for having impressive. us. John. Thanks for having Thank us. You. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with two of the Chicago Symphony's premier musicians, Associate Principal Clarinet John Ye and Concertmaster Robert Chen. I'm your host, John Hunter, digital editing and technical assistance from Monty Scott, and recorded at the studios of Chicago Public Media at Navy Pier.
Join us again for people and stories from the worlds of the symphony orchestra and commercial real estate for our next episode of Stages to Success.